Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. So glad you're with us for the Friday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Yes, we've once again made it to the end of the week. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis for you today. Uh, we are certainly thinking about and praying for those of you in the southeastern United States with Hurricane Helene from Florida through Georgia, Carolinas, Tennessee. Uh, this storm is huge. It's hitting a lot of different places. We pray that you're safe. We pray that your damage is minimal and that uh, things will be back to normal very, very soon. Jim, for our good martini, we actually go today to the United Nations. Yeah, we don't do the United Nations in the good martini very often, but it's because we're focusing on a speech today from Argentinian President Javier Millet. Most of the speeches at the UN this week, not good martini worthy, but from Javier Millet, definitely the case. We've talked about him a couple of times, uh, very libertarian in his economic outlook, uh, free market reforms, but his speech at the UN on a number of fronts was very, very good. First of all, let's uh, take a look at what he had to say about the institution itself and where it's headed. He did say some nice things about Woodrow Wilson's vision for a UN, which, you know, nobody's perfect, but he did say that uh, that vision, which was supposedly uh, based on the cooperation of nation states and peace without victory and all that stuff, it has been replaced by a model of supranational government of international bureaucrats who seek to impose a certain way of life on the citizens of the world. What is being discussed this week here in New York at the Summit of the Future is nothing other than the deepening of this tragic course that this institution has adopted. Thus, the deepening of a model that, in the words of the Secretary of the United Nations himself, requires the definition of a new social contract on a global scale, redoubling the commitments of the 2030 Agenda. He says, I want to be clear on the position of the Argentine Agenda. The 2030 Agenda, although well-intentioned in its goals, I would disagree with that, is nothing more than a supranational government program, socialist in nature, which seeks to solve the problems of modernity with solutions that violate the sovereignty of nation-states and violate the people's right to life, liberty, and property. It is an agenda that pretends to solve poverty, inequality, and discrimination with legislation that only deepens them. Because world history shows that the only way to guarantee prosperity is by limiting the power of the monarch, guaranteeing equality before the law, and defending the right to life, liberty, and the property of individuals. Then he focused on uh, the hypocrisy of the UN, and here's our clip as he talks about autocrats, uh, hypocrites, and uh, very unfair UN treatment of Israel. In this very house that claims to defend human rights, they have allowed the entry of bloody dictatorships like those of Cuba and Venezuela without the slightest reproach. In this very house that claims to defend the rights of women, it allows countries that punish their women for showing skin to enter the Committee for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. In this very house, there has been a systematic voting against the State of Israel which is the only country in the Middle East that defends liberal democracy, while simultaneously demonstrating a total inability to respond to the scourge of terrorism. Jim, I don't know if Javier Millet is my favorite world leader, but he's on a pretty short list right now. So, Greg, when, when we, I knew we were going to talk about this as our first martini, I decided to look up, how's Argentina doing? And I have two pieces of good news, one piece of bad news. The good news is that the inflation rate in August in Argentina was 3.9%. That is the lowest in 31 months. And if you're looking for some perspective, uh, back in December, it was 25.5%. Two and a half times as bad as it was at the worst of this big bout of inflation we had during the Biden year. So for perspective, like that's really worked. What, what uh, Millet has implemented is called shock therapy. It's a whole bunch of rapid changes all at once. There's no getting around the fact that it's going to have some bad parts. Uh, there's going to be some, you know, fiscal shock uh, with that. Wall Street Journal uh, just a couple of days ago pointed out that Argentina used to have one of the world's uh, strictest rent control laws designed to keep the homes affordable, but unsurprisingly, rent soared. We see a similar thing in New York City and other big cities. Basically, when you make it very hard for landlords to raise rent, that as soon as somebody moves out, they jack it up all as much as they can because they know they're not going to get a chance as soon as somebody moves in and doesn't move out for a stretch. Well, Argentina, they enacted this change and they thought it was going to be a disaster. Uh, the capital of Buenos Aires is uh, undergoing a rental market boom. Landlords are rushing to put properties back on the market. Rental supplies have increased by 170 percent. 
And while rents are still up in nominal terms, many renters are getting better deals than ever, with a 40% decline in the real price of rental prices when adjusted for inflation. Again, the inflation rate has come down very significantly. Now the bad news. The Argentina poverty rate is 53% which is bad. It used to be 42% when Malay took office. No doubt there are some people who are getting the short end of the stick in these economic reforms. But that having been said, if you want to create prosperity, you need the free market engines to start cooking again. And that's what they're in the process of warming up. Hopefully the poverty rate goes down as well. But I was thinking about somebody, first of all, somebody made the argument that Malay is the only conservative art, uh, leader in the Western hemisphere. I don't know if that's quite the case, but we know Mexico just elected another socialist. We know yeah. uh, the U.S. presidency is empty right now, but by January 20... <laughs> oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I've just been reminded Joe Biden is still our president. Not uh, a conservative, he's, though. <laughs> he's, he's napping, but yeah, he's no. Uh, Trudeau, you go down the list, it's slim pickings in terms of conservative leaders in the Western Hemisphere. I We remember back in the uh, Great Recession, the phrase, too big to fail. The idea that some of these banks had gotten so large that they knew the government would bail them out because if they had collapsed, the economic consequences across the country would be too dire. I almost wonder if Millet is reaching the point where he's too free to succeed, that it doesn't matter how good the results are in Argentina. If Millet manages to take an economic basket pace like Argentina was when he took over and turns it into a prosperous, thriving, rejuvenated economy, then it will be a, you know, like all the evidence you need that all of the big government solutions being enacted here in the United States, up in Canada, in Mexico, over in Europe, all across the world, there are leftist leaders who are like, no, no, our way is best. We can spend and tax our way into prosperity. Now, never, no matter how many times you know, it proves to fail, people always say, oh, no, this, this time it's going to work. If Malay goes down there and basically, you know, turns the lemon into lemonade, turns the, the so's ear into a silk purse, well, people are going to say, wait, why are we doing this? Look what, if they can do that in Argentina, why can't they do it here in America or in Canada or in Mexico or over in Europe? So I think you're going to, no matter how good things get in Argentina, It'll be like we, used, we were joking earlier in the week about how the homeless cover, coverage of the homeless only occurs during Republican presidencies. You're going to see spotlighting this child in Buenos Aires skinned her knee as a result of Javier Malay's policies. And there will be this like people need to convince you that Malay's policies don't work, because if they do work, then everything being enacted under progressive and democratic and liberal administrations all across Europe and North America will be, you know, effectively refuted. So keep I, I intend to keep an eye on this uh, year by year as Malay goes forward. Yeah, he hasn't been in office that long. So to see the turnaround from what mm. was an absolutely destitute economy uh, still has some improvement to make, as, as you mentioned, but uh, it's definitely headed in the right direction. And then to go to the UN and call out their hypocrisy. There's not many people who are going to mm. do that because they want to stay in their good graces. And everything he said is absolutely verifiably true. There's there's nothing you can say in response to that criticism. It's like, oh, no, we're not we're not uh, coddling Venezuela. Or we're not too tough on Israel or we're not allowing mm. ridiculous nations on the Council for Women. Of course, they're doing all of that stuff and much more. It's like you don't see a lot of coverage of Argentina in the United States press, period. Right. So that's that's probably, you know. Maybe soccer, right? You'll, you get a little bit of coverage there. You're going to hear about Argentina, I suspect, in the next two or three years. And you're going to hear about how bad it's going, no matter how low the unemployment rate gets, no matter how low the inflation rate gets, no matter how much uh, people are able to afford rents again. By the way, this, when I get like this, some people might think it's conspiratorial. I don't think they're going to assassinate them. I think they're going to character assassinate them. I think they're going to make the argument that it's not working as often as possible to discredit it. Because deep down, I think that, you know, even even liberals have a sneaking suspicion that this might actually work. Exactly. I don't know if the left in this country is going to pay attention because they keep trying to adopt the failed leftist policies that were already tried in Europe and thinking that somehow they'll work again here. Uh, but they should stand up and, and take note, giving people their own freedom, their own agency, their own property rights, keep more of their own money. Things generally tend to work out for that middle class that Kamala Harris keeps talking about. So, uh, yeah, definitely a guy to keep an eye on. I think more people should uh, should emulate his policies. And it's interesting as a guy who's a you know pretty self described libertarian, his instincts on the foreign stage, where most mm. libertarians are kind of standoffish, pretty darn good. All right, Jim, on to our bad martini now, and we keep hearing different stories of 
problems related to the fact that migrants are being shoved into communities uh, around the country. A lot of these communities not given the resources to deal with it. A lot of these people, no idea how to act in American society. Um, in some cases, uh, we've had the whole kerfuffle over Springfield, Ohio. And I think the the point that that's frustrating on both sides is that when you see stories across the country like this, yes, Democrats, there's a problem. And hey, Republicans, you don't need to exaggerate. These things are real and they're happening every single day in these communities. And the latest is right here in our own backyard in Fairfax County, Virginia. Bill Malusian of Fox News, their uh, lead border correspondent, but he's basically reporting this straight out of a press release from, uh, from ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. He says that ICE says a Venezuelan illegal alien who was caught and released at the Texas border in October 2022 was charged months later in Fairfax County, Virginia with malicious wounding, using a firearm in a felony, reckless handling of a firearm, and endangering a child. ICE placed a detainer request on him, but Fairfax County ignored it and released him from custody. Fairfax County Police then arrested him again in June of 2023 for using a firearm in the commission of a felony. ICE says they contacted the Fairfax County Jail to place a detainer on him, but Fairfax County had already released him from custody again. He was then arrested two more times this year, in February and in May, for DUI and hit and run. After both arrests, ICE says they placed a detainer request on him, but Fairfax County ignored ICE both times and released him from custody each time. Deportation officers from ICE's D.C. office were finally able to find him and arrest him in Springfield, Virginia this month, and he remains in federal custody. ICE says Fairfax County ignored ICE detainer requests three times and released this alleged violent illegal offender into the community four separate times. So, Jim, because they want to pose as the, you know, morally superior element in this particular debate over illegals in this country, they're letting people who are clearly a threat to the community back into the community over and over again. So I'm going to, it's going to seem like a segue to a completely different topic, but trust me, it's going to reach around to this. <laughs> so, uh, you know, listeners know my folks live down in South Carolina, right next to Hilton Head Island. They're only getting a, a you know, kind of the, the offshoot of the hurricane. They're kind of getting, you know, uh, they're, they're not in the direct path. They're getting some of the side effects. But apparently, you know, a little minimal rain. We, they've been through worse, so it looks like it's not going that bad. But apparently the wind was really intense at around like 5 a.m. this morning. So as a result of that, mom couldn't sleep. And when mom couldn't sleep, she decided to just text me at 5 a.m. Because, you know, I'm awake at that hour. Actually, you know, actually 9.35 last night. Apparently I put my phone down. Is Fairfax County a sanctuary county? Apparently it is. And I was not really paying that close attention to what my local law enforcement officials, because you would think, you know, the first one, like, okay, everybody gets one violent offense before we bother turning you over to ICE. Two, okay, look it up. But really, on the third violent offense, Fairfax County, you really should be turning these guys over to ICE. That this is, you know, even under the most ridiculously low standard, you have to stop doing this. You have to stop putting violent offenders back on the street. I, I would. This was. I thought. I saw this, and I thought about the guy who stabbed Lee Zeldin. Or I'm sorry, he's attempted to stab Lee Zeldin during a campaign event, was arrested, and then released on bail later that day. Now, should you at least be overnight? Is that really too much to add? You, you, the guy did try to stab someone. We have multiple a, a repeat offender, and Fairfax County just keeps letting him out over and over again and hoping for the best. Because heck, we can't have this guy deported. That might be xenophobic. Well, you know what? It turns out I am xenophobic against people who commit violent crimes. Ideally, every local law enforcement would be cooperating with ICE on everybody. But at minimum, the violent offenders seems like the, a ridiculously self-destructive policy. I am appalled to find this in my own backyard. Uh, I had really thought that after living in Washington, D.C., and then living in Alexandria, and then finally moving out here to Fairfax, I had moved to really the best possible class of socialists. And yet, um, <laughs> and yet here I am. No, that's insane. Uh, because first of all, if you're in the country illegally, you should be deported anyway. But on the first offense, particularly if there's anything violent related, done. The fact that they're deliberately not holding people, knowing that ICE is probably going to come for them soon, as soon as they realize that this person is being detained, it's just a revolving door. And we saw it with you know Alvin Bragg in New York. You see it uh, with uh, Gascon in Los Angeles. They finally got rid of Chase Abudin in San Francisco. But I'm pretty sure Fairfax County's got one of these Soros prosecutors too. I believe the name is Descano. They tried to get him out in the primary last year, but he's one of these guys that, I mean, it's, it's hard to see him as anything other than pro 
criminal with how light they are in the charges and how quickly they release people. So it's not just with illegals, but the, the way they treat illegals and prefer them over the safety of the community and cooperation with ICE uh, kind of shows you where these people are coming from. Greg, have you noticed that when you interact with any part of county government, paying your property taxes, trying to get hoping to get a property tax refund, speeding tickets, parking tickets, uh, change of address, almost anything you deal with is, is gonna be long, slow, methodical. But when it comes to letting the illegal immigrant out on the street, it, they, they got the speed of the flash, just quicksilver right there. They move super fast. Based on what I can tell, there are two things that Fairfax County does really fast. This, letting guys out of jail, and during the pandemic, I'm talking like April or May 2020, we had knocked down a the kid's uh, swing set. It was rotting wood. And it was all the kids had outgrown it. We have the wood on our front lawn or on, you know, why we put the trash cans. But apparently it's within 10 feet of the curb and you can't do that. And in April or May 2020, when the world has shut down for COVID, right? Businesses are shut. Governments are shut. Everybody say schools are closed. Everybody stay indoors. The world has stopped. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. You can't have that wood on your front lawn. That's we, we got the, the notice from the county on that one. So somebody was coming around looking for wood on lawn in a violation of county codes. And we had 10 days to remove it. So you know, even that deadline moved fast. You guys really know how to prioritize over there. Woo, you know, <laughs> fast at releasing criminals. Fast at writing you up for ridiculous uh, code violations, but slow at counting votes. They're yes, always, that, you know, always last and way later than they need to be. They're hoping to be done by December this year. <laughs> they're the most populous county in the state, but you know it's it's late into the night before any other precincts are reporting. And they usually. started voting on the twentieth. Like I know, you know, yeah. So we could we could go on yeah. time about Northern Virginia. Local it's turned into a very thing. local podcast today. <laughs> Here in Argentina, that's the, you know, the two. <laughs> and then somewhere in between, which is where we're headed next. All right, Jim, on to our crazy martini now. And we just did the story, I think it was last week, on the fact that uh, the Iranians are not only trying to kill Donald Trump, they're also trying to hack his... Uh, website and other resources, email system, and it appears that they've been at least moderately successful in doing that because we also got the story that uh, the Iranians tried to then shop that material to the Biden campaign and the Harris campaign and media outlets. And as of the time we discussed the story last week, nobody had bid on it because they, uh, you know, they're not going to go with material that was clearly stolen by the Iranians. Well, there's got to be somebody with no standards. And that person seems to be Ken Klippenstein, uh, who is a very objective journalist, he's worked at uh, outfits like the Young Turks, the Nation, and the Intercept. So no, he's not objective. He's about as far left as you get. But so he has now uh, decided to publish the dossier that the Trump campaign put together as they were vetting J.D. Vance. And so everybody else had laid off of this. But uh, Ken Klippenstein says, you know what? It's not my problem that the government is trying to stop malign foreign actors from influencing our politics. I got offered this. I think it's relevant. And if it had been hacked by somebody less uh, nefarious than the Iranians, other outlets would have run with it. So let's run with it. He says, it reportedly comes from an alleged Iranian government hack of the Trump campaign. And since June, the news media has been sitting on it, declining to publish in fear of finding itself at odds with the government's campaign against, quote, foreign malign influence. I disagree. The dossier has been offered to me, and I've decided to publish it because it's of keen public interest in an election season. It's a 271-page research paper the Trump campaign prepared to vet now vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance. As far as I can tell, it hasn't been altered, but even if it was, its contents are publicly verifiable. I'll let it speak for itself. If the document had been hacked by some anonymous-like hacker group, the news media would be all over it. I'm just not a believer of the news media as an arm of the government doing its work combating foreign influence, nor should it be a gatekeeper of what the public should know. Unlike the Steele dossier, which was both fraudulent and discredited, the Vance dossier is factual and intelligently written. No Jason Bourne-style caper appears and there's no sleaze. Instead, the Vance dossier enumerates pretty reasonable liabilities as a then-contender for a VP nominee. So... Jim, on one hand, I think some folks might be surprised that they actually did 271 pages of research into J.D. Vance. Uh, on the other hand, what do you make of Ken Klippenstein uh, deciding that, you know what, I don't care where this came from. 
I'm just going to go with it. I was going to say, considering how Vance has handled the controversy since he was named the vice presidential nominee, Ken Klippenstein may be the first man to actually read the opposition research that was assembled, uh, <laughs> either on the Trump campaign or anywhere else. So first of all, like, what kind of person are you where the Iranian government, the one that is sponsoring attacks on, on Israel, the one that has been the world's foremost sponsor of terrorism over the last couple of years, U.S. hostage crisis, like, you know, the, the mullahs in Iran are looking for an American to help them and they picked you. How does that make you feel? Do you feel, are you proud? Does it, do you feel walk around? Ha, the Tehranians think I am hot stuff. That's, that's you know, like, the, really? Really, you're that desperate for clicks? It's the other thing which is kind of bizarre, 271 pages. The stuff, you notice, no, like everyone's like, oh, you know, talk, discussing should Ken Klippenstein have published this. Very few people were talking about what was in there because it was the stuff that's already been reported and it's already kind of out there. I was on... Chris Wallace show a couple of weeks ago. And the question was like, why were media organizations that had received this from the Iranians res- you know, hesitant about publishing it when compared to the, uh, the, the you know, stuff that was hacked and, and by the Russians and put out uh, during the Hillary Clinton campaign? Well, first of all, let's point out, if there was really compelling evidence in there that um, J.D. Vance had been the Unabomber, then we probably would be hearing about that right now, or that he was an axe murderer or something like that. That would be big enough that would people would say, you know what, it came from a very shady source, it was obtained under very shady methods, but these, the revelation in there is important enough for the public to know. All these public, these uh, mainstream media institutions that got it, I think they looked at it and were like, meh, the juice is not worth the squeeze. This is not worth uh, doing that. Oh, by the way, each time we do this sort of thing, meaning, you know, the mainstream media, you're creating more incentives for Iran, China, Russia, and everybody else to do more hacking and to put more stuff out there. You are, you know, whether, I don't think this, they're, they should be uh, liable or prosecuted, but I do think that there is something distinctly unethical with helping hostile foreign regimes further divide American public by being their conduit, right? But then the other thing is like, again, I think it just seems kind of boring because if the news had been mass scale tax evasion, uh, although, honestly, according to Angela also Brooks, that's not big a deal. Anybody can take whatever. <laughs> that's the Maryland Senate candidate, by the way, who's running against Larry Hogan, who just accidentally took a whole bunch of deductions that she was not entitled to, uh, claiming things as her primary residence when they were not. But she she says it was a perfectly innocent mistake all multiple years that it occurred every single time on every property. And that's how it happened. And that she's totally fixing it. So no need to worry about it. Uh, what was her job again? Uh, Greg, I'm trying to remember. What, was, what did she do for a living? Prosecutor. She prosecutes crimes, including, I suspect, tax evasion. But hey, you know, no big deal or something like that. It says something about the Iranians that the biggest name person they could get to take the bait was Ken Klippenstein, who I'm suspecting most of our listeners have never heard of and yeah. probably will not hear from him very much after this. But like, he, you know, this is what he, he is. He is the conduit for information hacked illegally by the Iranians. That that's, that's what you go to his site for. That's what he has that nobody else has because everybody else has ethical standards to not publish it. Way yeah. to go. Yeah, exactly. I think he's got a sub stack now. But anyway, now the, the thing that actually- I mean, he's, really- it's a very substandard stack, yes. <laughs> Now, the thing that's gotten most of the mainstream media attention here is that by publishing it, he's been suspended on X by Elon Musk, who, of course, prides himself as being a champion of free speech. So the question now becomes is, was this a legitimate well, move by X or is this something that would then violate it because it, it goes against, uh, you know, what the government wants and against Musk's preferred candidate too? The X explanation, the explanation uh, was that it included uh, the social security number of J.D. Vance. Ah. And so if you think about it, Ken Klippenstein, you go to Staples, a black marker is only going to cost you two bucks at the moment. You know, it's like, so just go through it. Take a look at it. Look at anything that probably counts as doxing. Like, we don't really need to know. I I understand J.D. Vance lives somewhere in Alexandria where that the, the really bad socialists were. But I don't know where. And if I knew his home address, I would not put it out there because I don't want people messing with his kids and stuff like that. If you can clip and Steen gone through it, say, uh, you know what? That's his social security. That's the sort of thing that's going to help identity thefts. I'm going to I'm going to cross that one out right there. That would have avoided all this stuff. That the, the argument, at least from X, is that this wasn't because it was exposing stuff that J.D. Vance didn't want. It's that you're exposing social security numbers and stuff that amounts to doxing or identity theft. And um, hey, you know, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You know, Ken, you could clip 
that stuff. Ah, yeah, yeah. On that dad joke, Jim, uh, we'll call time for this week. Have a great weekend. Good luck to the Jets and the Bears, and I'll see you on Monday. See you Monday, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks so much for being with us today. Do subscribe to the podcast if you don't already and tell your friends about us as well. Thanks very much for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Please keep those coming. They are a huge help to us. Get us on your home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch Podcast. Follow us both on X. He is at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Best of luck. Our prayers are with you to our friends in the southeastern United States with this horrible storm. Uh, we pray that you're safe and we pray that the damage is minimal. And we hope you're with us again uh, next week. Take care.